Let me just tell you quickly about the Minnesota Student Survey. Uh, it is a population survey of students. Uh, now we're surveying grades 5, 8, 9, and 11, beginning in 2013. There are three forms of the survey. The fifth grade survey is the shortest. The ninth and 11th grade surveys are the, the longest. The longest form has 336 questions. It's huge. And thankfully, uh, these youth complete these surveys. It is optional for schools. Uh, the last administration, 84% of the districts in Minnesota participated. So it's really a, a great, very rich database. And there were 162,000 students in those four grades that completed the survey. The data on student background provides really unique access to investigate unique group differences and community differences. And this is what initially drove us uh, to look at the database. But quite frankly, 336 variables are too many. When, the, when these data go back to schools and, and school districts, most schools and school districts don't have the capacity to dig through 336 variables. Uh, the item level data are not particularly meaningful at program, system, and policy levels. Many districts uh, don't have awesome REA offices like, like Eric Moore. He's really got an amazing team to work with. Uh, and there are really only a handful of districts that have those kinds of research uh, offices. And so what we hear from schools is that it would be great if we had composite measures or, or bigger indicators uh, of stories to tell about our youth. That's what we took on. So I'm going to give you a hint of some of the technical processes that we go through in order to make sure that what we provide is appropriate, meaningful, and useful. And that is rigorous and sound. Uh, we use a positive youth development framework and ecological models of development. We identify items that are related to research-based constructs. We rely a lot on Bronfenbrenner, who, who taught us that kids exist in families and in peer groups and in schools and communities and society, and that these spheres of influence play an important role simultaneously in development of youth. We use confirmatory factor analysis to test model data fit to make sure that the models that we're looking at actually represent the associations and the nature of the data. We calibrate them using measurement models so that it's, it's sound, rigorous, and defensible. And, and then we interpret scores by transforming them in a way that gives us a guidepost. So they're just not arbitrary score, score systems. There's a score on all of these measures that gives us a guidepost for interpretation. And, and I'll, I'll explain that when we see a picture. So we've been able to do things like evaluate the ecological model of development. Do we see these interchanges between peers, schools, families, and communities, and the connections with, with youth as they develop over the ages? Uh, we are also now developing uh, ways to contribute to the research and the thinking about developmental skills or, or assets, or there's lots of names for these, non-cognitive skills, soft skills. Uh, it, we investigate now substantive issues. My students are looking at all kinds of interesting things, uh, and you'll see a little bit of hint of that as we, as we go on. But also importantly, we're able to look at uh, variation in different communities and, and what that is telling us about youth. So I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. Well, I should mention Generation Next uh, because Generation Next has been a major source of motivation for us to do this work because it's, it's a strong opportunity to apply some of this to practice. And I think that's why we're here today, to try to find ways to make these kinds of connections. So I've been very happy to uh, be invited to work with the Generation Next team uh, because they've been instrumental in our thinking and, and producing some of the results that we're going to show you today. We have identified three areas, developmental skills, and I should say these slides will be available in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned because you'll, you'll have access to these slides. We have identified developmental skills, which some might call assets, uh, developmental supports. Uh, these would be external assets, where developmental skills might be thought of as internal assets. And then some developmental challenges. Uh, we didn't want to go too far on this because unfortunately the Minnesota Student Survey is about 70% risky behaviors and, and challenges. Uh, it's still a little heavy on that side. 
but these are the things that, that we find in the literature that are really key components of positive youth development. We're going to look at pictures of commitment to learning, positive identity, social competence, and then sense of empowerment, a more general supported measure in terms of community and family support, and then a very specific teacher and school support measure. We'll take a look at these.